and we've been teaching on the subject of heaven's destination and uh, we this is the seventh teaching uh, so you're gonna have to probably go back to uh, one two three four five and six uh, and really I would advise that you do it would help you to understand uh, the Bible says that uh, God said in the book of Hosea my people perish for a lack of understanding amen if you don't understand then you're not going to succeed in gaining the victory so that's why we've been teaching this you know I uh, I believe that when you're born again that is the start of the Christian walk but it doesn't end there amen you uh, as, as as you're born again uh, Peter said grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ amen and so as you progress throughout your life you know you learn you you begin to grow and uh, we've been teaching that there are three heavens according to what uh, uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We know that the uh, tabernacle of Moses in Exodus 25 had three compartments or three separate compartments. The, uh, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Uh, we know that John the Revelator uh, speaks about heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and then he begins to see visions of the future. Amen. But uh, when you combine all these three scriptures together and through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will be able to understand that there is a first heaven, there is a second, and there is a third. Like I said, uh, like I've said before, Paul would have never said I ascended to the third heaven if there wasn't a second one, right? If there wasn't a first heaven. If I said to you, go to the third room, well, it means there's a second, it means there's a first, right? So exactly, so that's where we get... Uh, uh, the understanding from that when he said that he knew a man in Christ out of the body or in the body that ascended up to the third heaven which is paradise uh, we said well if there's a third heaven there has to be a second and if there's a second there has to be a first and then we go back to Exodus 25 and we see the three different compartments of the tab tabernacle of Moses and then we go to Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and John begins to describe someone sitting on the throne and then around the throne and he begins to describe uh, what he saw in the heavens amen i will remind you that uh, heaven is not streets of gold heaven is not pearly gates heaven is not uh you know uh, uh big walls you know that uh, go up thousands of miles in the in the sky uh, what you're describing there or what we're describing there is the new jerusalem and a lot of people get the new jerusalem confused with heaven amen well the new jerusalem is going to come down from heaven but that's at the end of the book of revelation after the 1000 year reign of christ after the judgment uh, of all things and then the bible says the new jerusalem uh, john saw the new jerusalem coming down from heaven so when you when people die right now well they enter into the supernatural realm which the bible calls heaven or the spiritual realm and they enter there and if you're a christian well you're going to be assigned to work uh, either in heaven number one heaven number two or heaven number three uh somebody said well you know i just uh, i hope and pray that i make it to one of them well i hope and pray that you make it too because the bible teaches that god said he doesn't want anybody to perish that's not god's desire he you know if you can't make it to three well make try to make it to two can make it to two or at least try to make it to one but you see the problem is this that a lot of christians can can uh, have the understanding have the teaching that is required have the ministry that they're under and the ministry that they're under understands these spiritual principles yet they hear him and hear him and hear him and they never do anything about what they're hearing james said it this way faith without works is dead amen he said be ye doers of the word he said, if not, you're just going to be deceiving you. And that is the danger that sometimes Christians go, well, I'm in this church and it teaches this and it teaches that. How do it? Well, if you don't do anything about it, it doesn't matter because faith without works is dead. Amen. So we've been teaching about the third heaven. Uh, and uh, we've been, we said that in order to get to the third heaven, you must overcome. Jesus uses the word overcome. Uh, seven times in the book of Revelation when he's talking to the seven churches in the, in the, in the uh, 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 area of Asia Minor. 
And we, un we understand that you must overcome because Jesus said to his disciples, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And we said that overcoming the world was overcoming the flesh, the five senses of the flesh, the, the, the taste, the touch, the hearing, the smelling, and the hearing. The world says if you, don't, if, you don't see, if you don't feel it, taste it, eat it, smell it, hear it in the flesh, then it doesn't exist. And that's what overcoming the world is. Overcoming the world is overcoming the flesh. And Jesus said, he who overcomes shall be with me. Uh, and will sit on my throne as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. That's in Revelation chapter 3. Amen. So that's where we are. And we hope uh, to pray. We pray and hope tonight that we will finish tonight. And then we'll see what the Lord leads us uh, to preach about uh, in the next coming Wednesdays. Uh, last Wednesday we did cancel. Uh, for the sake of uh, Thanksgiving, and no, it's not that Bishop was running around like a turkey without a head, no, but uh, I, I could have done the Bible study, but I know God's people, and I know how it is when a holiday comes in, people get all excited about the flesh, and you know, we just kind of put the spirit on the side, so I thought, well, we'll just leave it alone, and then we'll pick it up this Wednesday, amen, so I'm glad that you're joining me. And once again, my name is Bishop Michael Antiria. This is Kingdom Faith Church, and this is our Wednesday night Bible study. And we're doing Heaven's Destination, Part 7. Let us begin. Amen. Well, we left off the last time we got together. We left off. Uh, I'm going to start with point number five. Point number five in, in believers who get to the third heaven. Point number five. The third heaven believer has overcome the pressures of loving family and things more than loving the Lord. The third heaven believer, you die, you get to the third heaven because you've been working in the third heaven with the third heaven down here on earth. And this is what, this is what the believer must do. You must overcome the pressures of loving family more. Amen. Jesus said this to the church of Ephesus. He said, I have this against you, he said in Revelation chapter 2. You have left your first love. Other translations have, you have left the love you had in the beginning. Amen? So he says, remember where you have fallen. What was he telling the Ephesian church? Well, you, you were in love with me. You were in love with the anointing. You were in love with the Holy Spirit. You were in love with the Trinity. And, 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 you, you, know, and you were excited and in love. And then what happened? Well, you started falling in love you know, with other things, and then you started falling in love back, and you started loving more family, more things, more this, and more, you know, and more this. You know that there's people who love the ministry more than love the Lord? Amen? Wow, that is crazy, but it's true. Some people love the ministry more than they love the Lord. But Jesus said, He said in Matthew chapter 10, he who, ha he who loves father or mother, he said, is not worthy of me. Well, why? why? He said, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Why? Because whoever you love the most, folks, that's who you're going to sacrifice for. Amen? Whoever you love the most, that's who you're going to sacrifice for. I gave you the example of a lady who was going to get a, a bunch of money there in the church we belong to, and she was going to get a, a bunch of money. You know, and she said, uh, uh, she said to the pastor, well, I'm going to donate so much. And the pastor said, praise the Lord. We've been praying for some, for some new central air. The church seated, you know, over 500 people. So it was a very costly expenditure in fixing the AC system. And, uh, well, the sister said, yes, I'm going to give it and praise the Lord. So a week went by, two weeks went by. And then the pastor did what all pastors do. He went and knocked on the door and said, Sister, uh, you know, uh, we've been waiting for the, uh, the tithe from the money that you were supposed to get. This is what she said. Well, I was praying. Hmm. She said, I was praying and the Lord told me to give it to my children. So I'm going to give the tenth to my children. Well, who does she love more? Amen. And that's why Jesus said, if you love father, mother, daughters, sons, husbands, wife, ministry, preaching, the gifts of the Spirit, whatever it is, if you love them more than you love me, he said, you're not worthy of me. Point number five, the third heaven believer has overcome the pressures of loving family and other things more than the Lord. Amen. Point number six, 
The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of tribulation. The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of tribulation. He says to the Samaria church in, in Revelation chapter 2, he says, do not fear, Jesus speaking to them, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Oh man. He said, look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tried and you will have tribulation for 10 days. In other words, what he was saying is you're going to have a, the, a, a start of tribulation and there's going to be a start and there's going to be an end. Amen. That's what he was talking about. Not necessarily just 10 days. And what did he say? He said, do not fear those things that you're about to suffer. Amen. Point number six, the third heaven believer has overcome the fear of tribulation. What is tribulation? Tribulation is pressure. That's what the word means, pressure. You say, well, give me an example, Bishop. Well, it's kind of like when you're a Christian and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and then you go to a barbecue where there are no Christians. Ever been there? Amen. Ever been somewhere uh, where you're the only Christian or there's, a, you know, a few others, but nobody wants to talk about the Lord and nobody wants to talk about Jesus. Amen. How about in the office area? You know? I've said before, you can have a big old, you can have a seven foot cross in your office and people will go, oh my God. You know, you can have the name of God, G-O-D, in your door and people won't have a problem with it. But you start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and you start prophesying and saying, thus says the Lord. Oh man, that's going to bring you some suffering. And what Jesus was saying to the church of Smyrna, look, you're prophesying, you're using my name, you are casting out demons, you are setting people straight, not, not by being evil, by loving them and being kind and compassionate and all those things. And you're doing all these things. And because of that, you're changing the atmosphere. And when you change the atmosphere around you, guess what? Demons get very upset and very angry. You know, I told this believer, the devil doesn't care if you go to church three times a week. They said, he doesn't. I said, no, as long as you don't do anything about it, he's fine. He wants you to go to church three times a week, you know, but if you're not going to do anything with it, then he's, it's not a threat. And Christians who are going to enter the third heaven are going to have to overcome the fear of tribulation, the fear of pressure. You know, we were at... Uh, at a lawyer's office and I was uh, we were signing some papers uh, for the church you know and went to a lawyer because you know when you sign papers like that you have to get a lawyer involved and we and we hired this lawyer and you know and we were talking to the lawyer he was you know writing all the papers and signed here and signed there well the Lord had told me in my previous uh, uh, prayer time he said I want you to tell the lawyer that I want him to go back to the faith he used to have as a child and I thought, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> this guy's a lawyer. Lord, you know, he's educated. <laughs> I, you know, he said, tell him that I want him to go back to the faith he had as a child. So there we are in the office and you know how tense it is. You know, well, how tense is it, Bishop? Well, it's kind of like when I get up to preach, you get all tense, that kind of tense. It was all tense, you know, and I'm all tense and he's tense. You know, it's a weird situation. We're going to, I think back then, they charged us six, $650 to transfer some papers, right? Uh, so here we are, amen, here we are, and, uh, and we're there, and the pressure's there, you know, and all that. And then, and then what happens is that I say, sir, uh, uh, I had a dream last night, and he said, he put the pen down, and he said, okay. I said, uh, in the dream, I heard uh, that... Uh, I don't know, maybe it was a vision, I don't remember, but I know that, that I heard it. I said, I heard that uh, the Holy Spirit wants you to go back to your faith as a child. And man, he put his head down and he pondered for a little while and then he raised his head up and he said, wow. He said, okay. And I said, well, okay, let's continue <laughs> with the... Uh, what was going on here, you know, and then we, he finished the paperwork and then guess what? <laughs> the bill came in, 600 and something dollars we had to pay. Amen. But what I'm saying is, see, there was pressure there on me. 
There was pressure. The tribulation was there. Don't say it. Don't say nothing. You know, you're going to look like an idiot. You know, he's going to think you're a religious maniac. Don't say it. Don't do this. Don't do that. You don't know who he is. What if you didn't hear from the Lord? Pressure. Amen. That's what pressure does. And what happens when we do obey? Well, it causes a lot of suffering. Now, in this situation, the lawyer, you know, found it. Uh, you know, he got excited. He said, oh, praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, another situation, I was called for jury duty, you know, and, and, and uh, where it says occupation, I was going to put on there unemployed. And then I thought, well, I'm not unemployed. I work for the, for the Lord. And I thought, oh, man, I know that if I put pastor, oh, man, you know, the, you know, the lawyers are going to eye me out, right? And so I filled everything else out and I thought, no, I have to do what I feel. So I put on there pastor. Well, we get to, you know, where they picked, you know, 50, uh, 50 jurors and then they take you to a room, you know, and right there with about 50 to 75 jurors, the lawyer said, Mr. Renteria, where are you? And I said, uh, here I am. He said, hmm. He said, you're a pastor? I said, yes, sir. I preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, uh, well, he said, are you sure that you can make a judgment on this trial based on the knowledge of the law or do you have to hear divine inspiration? Well, what, what was I supposed to tell the guy? You know, I said, uh, I said, yes, sir. I said, I can, uh, I can make a judgment based on the knowledge of the law. See, but he put me on the spot. See, and then after the after the break, you know, I had several people who were Christians who came up to me and he said, wow, oh, man, you know, how did he know you were a pastor? And I'm like, well, dummy, I put it on there. But you see, I felt from the Holy Spirit that I needed to and it caused pressure. The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of tribulation or the fear of pressure. Point number seven, the third heaven believer has overcome the fear of death. Oh, man. Oh, Lord Jesus, take a breather. Amen. The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of death. Notice what he says to the church, the same church. You, uh, he says, you will be tested. You will have tribulation 10 days. And then he says this, be faithful even unto death. You see, folks, if you love children and husband and wife and things more, the ministry, preaching, the gifts of the Spirit, then if you love all these things more, you're not going to be faithful unto death. But if you love him more, then you will be faithful unto death. Now, let me just say a few words about that. It doesn't mean that you walk around, you know, like Superman. You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, when you sense a threat from somebody, you just go, you know, you take your jacket off and you go, okay, super Christian, right here, go ahead. I'm not afraid of death. That's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. Jesus, the Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, there he sweat uh, sweats of blood. He was so much under pressure and stress and the fear of death that he, he said, look, if there's any other way we could do this, Father, and you know the story, he did it three times. No, it's not talking about that, but it's talking about that there are situations that God is going to put you and you're going to have to trust him even unto death. Even unto death. I've been in several situations like that. Amen. That you, you, have, you have to trust in the Lord. You know, you just have to because if you don't, well, then, you know, then it's not going to happen. He's not going to allow something to move against you if you're not at that level. Amen. Or that understanding, you know, he'll test you and he'll prove you. But the time comes and you have to say, OK, Lord, I'm putting my trust in you and I'm going to serve you until even unto death. So the third heaven believer has overcome the fear of death. You know what the number one fear of Christians is? The fear of death. Amen. Man, you can preach a, a sermon on heaven and the glory of heaven and hallelujah heaven and this and that. And God's people will sit there with a frown. You go, uh, church, we're preaching about heaven. Hallelujah. Streets of gold and, you know, and, and, and seeing Jesus and God and the angels and everybody's like, <laughs> you know Why? Because they're afraid of death. Christians are not supposed to be afraid of death. Amen. 
So the third heaven believer has overcome the fear of death. Amen. Notice what he says again. Uh, he says here in Revelation chapter 2, this is point number 8, to the church of Pergamum. He says, but I, have a th but I have a few things against you. You have those who hold the teaching of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet from Mesopotamia who was willing to use God's talents to prophesy against Israel. Somebody paid him. Somebody paid him. And he said, well, yeah, you pay me enough. I'll go prophesy against Israel. Of course, it, it never came to pass because God didn't allow it. But that's what Jesus is saying, is saying here to this church. So what is he saying? Point number three. The third heaven believer has overcome the use of Yahweh's gifting for personal gain. See, if you're in the first heaven, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because you're, you're still trying to figure out not to sin. You're still trying to figure out righteousness. You're still trying to take over the flesh, to crucify the flesh. And you still get angry and you want to do things. that, oh my God, you know, you're still there. But here in the second heaven, in the second heaven, you overcome all that. You walk in righteousness, and then you're promoted to the second heaven. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace. Amen. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Amen. So in the second heaven, then you begin to understand. You see the light of the Holy Spirit. The light of the menorah was there in the holy place in the tabernacle of Moses, and it was on 24 hours a day. Amen. And there you begin to see things. And people who are in the second heaven, they move in the anointing. They move in the spirit. You know, they understand the light. They understand who they are. They're not praying selfishly. And they begin to use the power and the gifting of the spirit. And guess what? Many of them are tempted to use the gift for their own personal gain. Let me give you an example. Say, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Yes. Many, many years ago, uh, I was in, we were, the church was in, finan in financial need. And I was thinking, you know, uh, well, you know, you, I turn on the TV and all these preachers are saying that, you know, all you got to do is have faith to believe. And God will send, you know, whatever uh, money you need, right? Just have faith to believe. Well, uh, I had been praying and asking God for some finances. And then one Sunday morning, I pray every Sunday morning. Uh, and uh, at this time, I was praying by myself. So I was praying by myself one Sunday morning. Uh, and the Lord Jesus said to me, I mean, the, I heard a voice, excuse me. I heard a voice that said, uh, the voice gave me some information on a future event that was going to happen. Right. And all I had to do was put money in there. Well, uh, put money into it. Right. So I saw the whole thing. I heard the whole thing and I said, man, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, uh, God's given me some information so that. Oh my God, the blessing is going to come. And then the next day, oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I thank God for his mercy because where would Bishop Lentería be without God's grace and mercy? I'd be gone and you would too. Amen. So the next day, what happens? I'm in prayer again, thanking Jesus. I was all excited. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I did not give you that information. Oh, Lord Jesus. What happened? Well, the enemy was manipulating me so that I could use my gifts of hearing and discernment in a, to use them uh, wrongly in the kingdom of God. And there are many people who, once they reach the second heaven, a level of understanding, a level of gifting, they begin to use the gift against God's people. Amen. In other words, you know, those who have discernment, right? Uh, a, let's say a, let's say a person has discernment and you can discern what a, 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 a another brother or sister is going through or you can discern you know the problem in the office and then you take advantage of that because you know exactly what's going on that is evil and a lot of preachers a lot of uh, deacons a lot of elders uh, fall under that trap and uh, this guy uh, named uh, uh, Balaam he fell into that trap Amen. And you're going to have to overcome that. It is very tempting. It is very tempting to get information because you're in the spirit and you hear things. But you always have to do what I do and what I was taught to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, I enter the spirit round and only the voice of the Holy Spirit, only the voice of Jesus, only the voice of my heavenly father. Only the voice of the heavenly angels who are under the agency of Jesus the Christ. And then this is what I finish.
praying. This is before I start praying. Then I say, I renounce any other demon, any other voice, any other spirit in the name of Jesus. And sometimes those demons don't like it and they'll manifest, you know. But hey, I'd rather them manifest and not fall under this sin. Amen. So you got to be real careful. The third heaven believer has overcome the use of Yahweh's gifting for professional gain. Do you know that a lot of people who are famous right now started singing in church? A lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people and that are famous, you know, started singing in church. They had a gift, and guess what? They sold out to the world. I was in a special service uh, one time uh, uh, preaching, and there was a young man playing in the band, and Ma, he had a great voice, and man, he could play that instrument. And the Lord said to him, the Lord said to me, tell them that that if he's not careful and doesn't walk with me faithfully he's going to end up using his gift for the world and i told him that of course his eyes became as you know as big as as as, as mountains you know and he just looked at me like wow and uh six months later i talked to the pastor and i said how's brother so-and-so doing he said well you prophesied exactly what was going on and he left and now he's playing for the world i thought wow see the gifting was for god and then he used it for the world. It's the same principle. Amen. Let us continue. Point number nine. The third heaven. Let me read you to you first. Uh, uh, Pergama. Re uh, Revelation chapter two. The church of Pergama. Jesus says, You also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a group of people. Now they, they had some serious problems. And in order, you know, I thought about talking about these people. You know, and I thought, man, I'm going to take an hour, you know, so I'm just going to give you the gist of it. Amen. But you can do a search uh, and go to BibleStudy.com or BibleGate.com and you can get some information there. But the problem with these people, with the Nicolaitans, is that they were in a church and they taught that basically that God's people had a license to sin. That Jesus had paid for past sins, had paid for for the now sins and for the sins of the future and you could do whatever you wanted and the grace of God would just cover you because anyway your spirit was saved and boy I tell you they they did a mess of things uh, in the church amen and uh, Jesus says to the pastor of the church of Pergamon you got those people there the Nicolaitans and, and in another place he says I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans because they teach you can sin, you know, and not a problem, you know. Well, there is a problem. And if you've been under my ministry, you know, what's the problem? That God doesn't forgive you? Of course not. God forgives any sin. The problem is that when we sin, we sow a seed. And the seed of sin is not aborted. That's the problem. Amen. And it comes back. Amen. That's why we believe that we need to walk in righteousness. It's not that God's not going to forgive us. God will forgive you for everything except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I've been around for a little while and I haven't even come close to somebody being blasphemous against the Holy Spirit. You know, at, at one time I thought I did know somebody and God said, no, you don't. You don't know. I said, okay, forgive me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Then I heard that voice and right here in my heart and boy, it scared me because I was assuming that, that the person had blasphemed me, the Holy Spirit. Amen. No, all sin is forgiven. Amen. But what happens when, when uh, what, what was happening with these people, this Nicolaitans? Well, they would tell people, go ahead and sin. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. And people got into a bunch of situations, into a bunch of mischief with the devil because they were believing these people. Amen. How does it work now? Well, it works real easy. All you have to do is go to Facebook and you probably have thousands and thousands of friends and you will find a post that says something along these lines. I'm not perfect. I am a sinner, but Jesus forgives me. You think, wow, okay. You, you just gave glory to the devil. Because 1 John says, he who sins is of the devil. 
You see? So when somebody puts on there, I'm just a sinner, I'm not perfect, I fall, you know, but Jesus forgives me, you know, you know, forgives me all my sins, and he does forgive you. But what you just posted, what the person just posted on Facebook, is that I've been sinning and acting just like the devil, because that's what John said in 1 John, he who sins is of the devil. So next time you sin, don't think, oh my God, I, I, I miss God. No, you need to say, I acted just like the devil. Jesus, uh, uh, John said, he was uh, uh, a sinner. He was a, uh, uh, a, he sinned from the beginning. Jesus said about the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. Oh Lord Jesus, amen. Point number nine, the third heaven believer has overcome the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which taught believers basically, don't worry about it, God's going to forgive you. Well, I didn't tithe, don't worry about it. Well, I didn't pray, don't worry about it. Well, I missed church again, don't worry about it. Well, I thought evil things against my neighbor, don't worry about it. I was mean to my husband, don't worry about it. I was mean to my wife, that's okay, you know, and this and that. God's going to forgive you anyway. And we think, well, praise the Lord. Well, that's a half truth. He does forgive you. Amen? He does. The blood of Jesus covers all our sins. But now we have to deal with the fruit of the sin, with the seed that we sowed. That's going to come back. And we're not going to like that at all. Amen. And that causes a lot of problems and allows the devil to come in. All right, let us continue. Point number 10. Drink some water here. The third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of domineering and controlling of others. Some of you know exactly where I'm going. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus said to, uh, to the church of Tyra, uh, he said, uh, uh, but I have a few things against you. You permit that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Amen. So what is the spirit of Jezebel? The spirit of Jezebel is control. The spirit of, of Jezebel is, is, is when, when, when uh, people dominate other people, when people control other people, and that is evil. It, it, it boggles the mind because there's a lot of churches who do not let women wear pants, do not let women put on a little bit of makeup, do not let women get all pretty. They say that's the spirit of Jezebel. No, that's just the spirit of makeup trying to look the face a lot prettier. It's not the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is controlling and domineering. And what are these churches doing to their women? Not only their women, their men. I can go to a church uh, in, here in the valley, some churches in the valley, and I will be rebuked because I have a, a mustache and a goatee that have no hair. I will be rebuked. Really, it happened to my wife and I one time in, uh, in Houston a long time ago. We went to visit this church thinking, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, we got out of there, you know, they, they rebuked us. And I couldn't figure out why. My wife couldn't figure out why. Well, later on, we knew. Oh, my wife had makeup on and I had a beard. You know, back then I did have hair. So bless the Lord. Amen. But that's what it is. Amen. The third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of domineering and controlling of others. Amen. That is evil. The only person who is supposed to be in control is not even God. It's supposed to be you. Let me say it again. The only person who is supposed to be in control of you, it's only you. It's not even God. God doesn't make anybody do anything. You know what the devil does? The devil makes you do stuff. Why? Because he controls you. You know, how many people have done drastic things? How many people have done evil things? And you talk to them and you say, well, why did you do it? And they say, uh, you're not going to believe me. And I say, well, try me. Well, I... I wasn't in control. It felt like somebody had my body in it. I just, it was so surreal. Well, somebody did have your body and that was the devil. Amen. And that's what the devil does. He controls people who are supposed to be in control. God, no. The Holy Spirit, no. You are supposed to be in control. And the only one controlling you is supposed to be you. Amen. Jesus works with you. The Holy Spirit works with you. And even God Almighty Blessed be the Lord who works with us. Amen. So the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of domineering and controlling of others. Point number 11. The third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of sinning through the gift of righteousness and holiness. Amen. Look what he says to the church of Sardis. You have a few names in Sardis who have not soiled, have not soiled their garments. When you study the symbolism 
of what soiled their garments means. It literally means they did not sin. They kept their garments clean. Their garment equals their spirit. And Jesus says to the church of Sardis, you have some of the charters who have not sinned. And I know what some people are thinking. Uh, not sin? Well, yeah, then you're probably still in level number one. You're probably still in the first heaven because in the first heaven, you don't believe that you can you can walk without sinning. But the Bible teaches that we can. Amen? The Bible teaches that we can. The Bible teaches uh, in Romans 5, 17 that we have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness uh, in Christ Jesus. So we believe, the Bible teaches we believe that uh, we have received the, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. See, a lot of people believe in the gift of salvation. Oh man, you, you, they, they, you know, you will not convince them otherwise and that's good. But there's more gifts than just salvation. There's the gift of grace, which is an abundance of grace, Paul says. And not only that, do you know and do you understand that God has given you a gift of righteousness? Say, oh Lord Jesus, I didn't believe that. Yes, you don't. That's why a lot of Christians can't get out of the first heaven because they don't believe they can achieve. They don't believe they can do it. Well, in your own power, you can't, of course. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why Jesus said, with man, he said, impossible. With God, he said, all things are possible. Hallelujah. Now, religious people don't like this point. Religious people don't like for people, for Christians to say, Yeah, boy, I tell you, I've been walking three months in the Spirit and I have not sinned one time. Boy, they look at you with those demonic evil eyes. They look at you and they say, Who do you think you are? You go, Well, I don't think I'm anybody, but I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. And they'll point at you and say, No, you can't. Really? Then the then Paul was lying. Incredible. Amen. No, we can do all things through Christ. And you're going to have to the third heaven believer. The, 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 the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of sinning. Doesn't mean you don't make a mistake. It doesn't mean you don't put your foot in your mouth. That's just, you know, uh, attitudes and, and personalities. You know, of course, you're going to make mistakes. Of course, you're going to put your foot in your mouth. We're talking about sinning. Amen. And the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of sinning. Why? Because they believe. And by the time they get to that place, they go, man, that hallelujah. They got out of the first heaven, which is righteousness. And they keep on walking in that gift of righteousness in the second heaven. And they keep on walking in that gift of righteousness in the third heaven. The third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of sinning through the gift of righteousness and Holiness. Look at what Peter said. Uh, and, and you can give this scripture to a bunch of people who don't believe in the holiness of God here on earth, in your flesh, in your spirit. You can give them this scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He says, But he who has called you is holy, so be holy in your conduct. Be holy in the way you act. Why? Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So how are you going to answer that one? Oh Lord, you want another one? Let's give you another one. This is what the writer of the Hebrews wrote in chapter 12. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Pursue. Go after peace and go after holiness. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. How do you answer that? Well, how does that work? Exactly. Amen. Where is the Lord? We're in the third heaven. Oh man, somebody pray about that one. Amen. Point number 11. The third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of sinning through the gift of righteousness and holiness. It's done under his power. It's done under his might. It's done under his mercy and grace and the gift of righteousness. It is done through him. Not in us. We can't do it. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That we can do. Amen. We're almost done. Praise the Lord. Hang in there. The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of entering new revelation and new spiritual territory. The third heaven believer has overcome the fear of entering into new revelation and new spiritual territory. This is what he says to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3. The Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, 
and closes and no one will open. I have placed before you an open door that no one is able to close. An open door refers to new revelation. It refers to new spiritual territory. A door lets you go in from one room to the other and a door also stops you from going one from one room to the other so jesus said to the church of philadelphia i've given you an open door in other words he said don't be afraid uh, to walk in the new revelation and the new spiritual territory that i'm going to give you you know what happens many of god's people they, they, you know, they, 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 they want to stay where they are because that's the way we are. And that, then God comes along through a spirit of revelation, uh, through a teaching, through, through the Bible. And guess what happens? We get fearful. Or let me put it this way. Here we go. Somebody, a preacher says to some church member, I see you preaching the gospel. I see you preaching this. I see you doing this. I see you doing this in the kingdom. And you know what happens? Boy, they just go, oh my God, I could never do that. See, they just, they just, uh, they have fear entering into new revelation. And when you enter into new revelation, you're entering new territory. Amen. And that's how it works. And many people fear that and they don't want to be messed with just leave me alone i'm going to heaven well yeah of course you are every believer that believes in jesus the christ the son of the living god died for our sins rose from the dead accept him and confesses with them in their heart that jesus is lord of course you're going to go to heaven but the problem is where the first one the second one the third one where are you going to be put to work a lot of Christians are going to die thinking, boy, I tell you, I can't wait. Whew, can't wait to get to the third heaven. And then they're going to stop in the first and go, go, okay, what happened? The angel of the Lord's going to tell them. The angel of the Lord's going to tell them, you never overcame. You got stuck in the first heaven. Well, when do I see God? Well, you'll see him. <laughs> oh, Lord. Amen. Remember, the first grader doesn't know what the second grader does. The second grader, the, the second grader knows more than the first grader. Now the third grader knows, knows more than the second and more than the first. And that's how you can describe the third heavens. First heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. And however faithful you are here on earth, Jesus is going to reward you. He says, I come back and my reward is with me to give to you every man. He's going to reward you. If you haven't been faithful, then I'm sorry. You're not going to get anything. Oh, you're going to heaven. But you're not going to get rewarded because you didn't do anything. Amen. You didn't do anything. You just believe that Jesus was the Son of God. You know? So in other words, the, the, the thief who died on the cross a few hours before, you know, he's going to die in a few hours. They're going to break their legs, you know, with a hammer, break their knees so that they can't breathe anymore. He's getting ready to die and he confesses. Jesus, remember when you come into your kingdom, Jesus said, I assure you will be with me in paradise. So that thief, that criminal got rewards no he didn't get anything you know why because he didn't do anything what did he get well he got salvation and i'm sure that he probably you know right there at the edge of hades and heaven right probably right there at the very edge amen no strive uh, to get to the third heaven strive to get to the second if you're in the first if you're in the second then strive to get to the third don't uh, don't uh, uh, miss misappreciate don't don't uh, you know just cast the word of god and the holiness of god and the cross of the lord jesus christ and him dying on the cross and going through all the pain and hell that he went to to get men to back to get men to reconcile back with god don't be unappreciative of that. Don't be unappreciative of that. How many parents, you know, that they're, that they're now in their 60s and they look back at, at their kids' lives and they, and they probably talk in the, in, the, in the bedroom by themselves and they say, boy, I tell you, we gave so much to these kids and boy, they never, you know, they never took advantage of anything, didn't they? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. How does, the, how does the mother and father feel? They feel terrible. Because the father and mother sacrificed and sacrificed so that they could have a better life. And guess what happened? They didn't appreciate it. And that's what happens to a lot of Christians. Jesus paid the price. He made a way for us to go all the way to the third heaven. And most Christians, they don't appreciate it. Why? Because it's fun doing what they, it's fun doing what they want to do. You know, it's easy to go to church Sunday morning, you know, and then maybe Wednesday and then that's it. We'll see you later, alligator, after a while, crocodile. 
It doesn't work that way, folks. Faith without works is dead. Amen? The last point, somebody said, praise the Lord. Yes, praise the Lord. The last point, the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of materialism. Notice what Jesus said to the church of Leso Lucia in Revelation chapter 3. He says, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, he said, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Jesus said in Matthew 16, What is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What is it going to profit your children, mom and dad, if they're going to wear all the Nike stuff, you know, all the latest fabs, and they're going to be dressed so, so nice and wear the expensive stuff because you don't want kids to make fun of them when they go to school. You don't want other people to make fun of your children. You know, so we work hard and hard and hard and hard and work hard and all that. For what? And we don't give them a spiritual inheritance. Then what good is it? And that's what Jesus was saying. What is the profit of man? What is the profit of your children, our grandchildren? What is the profit them if they gain the whole world and they lose their soul? It did profit nothing. Amen. And that's what Jesus was saying. You know, look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's lives did not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. What is the number one problem in America? Materialism. Materialism. You know, you can go to every home in America, almost every home in America, and people have air conditions, they have TVs, they have furniture, they have stoves, they have refrigerators, they have electricity, running water, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, you know, and, and guess what? And they're still miserable and unappreciative. Why? Because they love materialism. And what does materialism do? Well, you buy a car, you know, and it's good right now. And then later you want another one. Don't you look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about, church member. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what happens. Something makes you happy for a little while and material wise. And then later, eh, something else. And that's what we're going to have to overcome. The third heaven believer must overcome the spirit of materialism. It's a spirit. It's a demonic spirit. It's a demonic spirit. Most people think, well, it's just me. No, it's not you. It's a demonic spirit. Because a demonic spirit of materialism, that's how it flows. When you buy things, when you go see a new house and you buy a new house and you buy a new car and you buy a new furniture and you buy a new TV and you go here and all that stuff and that demon of materialism is just moving through God's people, moving through everybody. Say, so, well, is it wrong for me to buy a car? Of course not. If yours is old, buy a new car. If you're on a lease, get a new car. That's fine. But don't let the, don't worship the car. Don't think because you have a new car, people are going to look at you. Let me tell you. And I hate to break your heart. People already made up their mind about you. Nothing you buy, nothing you say is going to change that. We don't worry what that people say. That's why Jesus said, what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? For what? For nothing. And Jesus also said, be careful that you don't spend your time accumulating things because life is more important than that. And of course, the very famous one, no servant can serve two masters. He either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one or the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And I know what most of you are thinking. Well, I'm just a little poor old Christian, Bishop. I'm just a little poor old Christian. You know, I'm not rich, you know. Well, let's go talk to people across the border. Let's go talk to people who, who don't have a floor. I remember the first time I went to Reynosa with some friends of mine, and we went to visit some cousins that they had there, you know, and, you know, I said, uh, 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 I said, wow, what are these all little shacks for, for their tools, for, you know, for their tools, for, you know, and there was a very poor neighborhood, they said, tools, I said, yeah, like a garage, they said, man, this is, that's their houses, man, I thought, oh my God, and I remember I went into one of those houses, and I'm like, wow, I lived in a brick home, three bedroom brick home. Did I get it? No. But I didn't have the Holy Spirit back then. I was just 15, 16 years old. Amen. 
And the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of materialism. We have overcome that. What happens to a lot of churches? Well, they want to grow. Why? Because they want bigger buildings. And then they get bigger buildings and they build another one. And they do this and then do that. You know what's going on? They're like the church of Lesodicea. Jesus said to that church was, was famous. That church was big. It was probably a mega church. Had everything that you wanted in go, to go to church with, you know. Go to, go to this church in Lesodicea. You could probably get some, uh, some, some uh, coffee right there in the coffee shop. And uh, you would probably get an email from the youth director saying, uh, we're taking all our kids to Fiesta, Texas, all expenses paid. So don't worry about it. You go, whoo, I like that church. Well, yeah. Amen. Yeah. But not if it's naked, miserable, wretched, and poor. And that's what Jesus said. You know, you say, I don't need, that. I don't need anything. I'm doing well. Well, that's what Jesus said. Amen. You're miserable, poor, and naked. What is the profit of man if he gains the whole world? Amen. So the third heaven believer has overcome the fear of, um, excuse me, the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of materialism. It takes a while to get out of that one because you'll convince yourself that you do need it. Amen. You convince yourself that it's going to be bring happiness to you. You convince yourself that that's exactly what you need. And then you get it. And guess what happens? Let me tell you what that reminds me of, you know. Uh, back when I was a kid, you know, we used to get Christmas toys, you know, and a little truck or a little fire engine truck or, you know, a little toy, something like that. And I remember that, uh, man, I couldn't wait to open the presents. We all would meet at my grandma, Grandma Kuka's house and I would open the presents. And, oh, man, look at my big toy truck. Woo, this fire truck. I love it. And boy, I'd be playing with it day in and day out. And then a couple of weeks later, months later, my dad would come into the house and he would say, Where's that toy that I bought you for Christmas? And I go, what toy? The toy that's outside. I've seen it outside for three days and you know what it was? I would go, nah, I don't want that toy anymore. But folks, I was six, seven, eight, nine years old. I was just a kid. I wasn't a born again Christian. And many born again Christians fall under the trap of the spirit of materialism, especially pastors. Oh man, they fall under this trap because we're convinced by the devil that that's what the kingdom of God is. And that's not what it is. Many people criticize us for our building. We don't have a very big building. You know, we're out in the country and many people criticize us because of our building. What kind of church are we? And it's like I told this uh, more on one time, God called me to build a church, not buildings. And of course I shut them up very well. But most people want the big buildings. And, and that's fine if God gives you the big building. But if he doesn't give it to you, if it's not what he wants you to do, you know. I mean, if you look at the life of Jesus and you judge Jesus based upon, upon what Christianity is today and, and upon what is being successful, Jesus would be a failure. By the end of his ministry, before they crucified him, he had only 12 disciples. Everybody else had forsaken him. And even they forsake him. See, Paul, the greatest apostle that ever lived, saved 10 here, 20 here, 15 here, 5 here. And the Bible says that Paul was a tent maker. Can you imagine that? Being a tent maker? The greatest apostle that ever lived, yet he was a tent maker. Amen? See, it's not based on that. And uh, the third heaven believer has overcome the spirit of materialism. You must overcome that, and you only overcome it by prayer. You only overcome it by being faithful to where God has placed you, under whatever church God has placed you, by studying the Word, by walking in the Spirit, by resisting the devil, by believing in the gift of righteousness and the gift of salvation, the gift of righteousness and the gift of abundant grace. By believing in all those things and believing that God is for you who can be against you and believing what Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And if you're faithful to that, I guarantee you that you will arise and enter the third heaven when you die and you get ready to go home with the Lord. You will. You will. Because God is not an evil judge. God is not an unrighteous boss. How many people work their behind off for certain companies and then you know what? They lay them off. Sorry, profits are low. 
and you go, profits are low? Yeah, profits, yeah, they're low. Profits are low, yeah, so, so you're not losing money. Oh no, we're not losing money, but profits are low, so you got to go, Jack, and they just throw you out like a worn-out shoe. That's what the world does. Jesus, the Lord doesn't do that to us. However hard we work, he is going to come with his reward and we're going to be blessed by that. The more you work in the kingdom, the more you work for him, the more reward is coming to you. The less you work for him, the less you work in the kingdom, then the less reward is coming to you. And we're not going to be able to complain because he knows it all. He is the king of glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to uh, stop there. So this is our seventh teaching on heaven's destination. We believe there are three heavens, the first, the second, and the third. And we believe that uh, when you die, a Christian is going to enter the first, the second, or the third. We get that revelation from Exodus 25, the tabernacle of Moses. At three separate compartments, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And then we go to the book of Revelation and read what John saw in, in chapter 4. Uh, there and all the way to chapter 5 and then we get the understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit may I say through the power of the Holy Spirit we begin to put all these things together and through the power of the Holy Spirit we begin to understand so I pray that this has blessed you I pray that you're not going to be a, a hearer of the word and not a doer I pray that, you're, that uh, your faith is going to have some works because if not James said it this way, then you're just deceiving yourself. Wow. Deceiving yourself. Not the devil deceiving you. Deceiving yourself. You can go back. Uh, all our uh, uh, seven, our, our previous six teachings on our Facebook. Uh, and you can enjoy them at uh, your own pleasure and at your own time. My recommendation is that you don't change. You don't shortchange yourself. Because many are going to get to the first heaven and they're going to kick themselves in the behind. And they're going to tell others in the first heaven, if I had known it was this beautiful, you know, in the second and the third man, I would have done, yeah, well, too late now. It's too late now. But right now it's not too late. Paul said, redeem the time for the days are evil. Don't waste your time anymore. Go to work, feed your kids, clean house, wash the car. Do all those things that people have to do. But don't forget to spend time with the Holy Spirit and the Word and in prayer and in fellowship with the saints. Going to church, viewing the online videos and studying to show thyself approved. My greatest desire is that when I go home to be with the Lord, I will enter the third heaven. That's my greatest desire. And you know what? Uh, I'm going to do it. Not in my strength. In the name of the Lord, I'm going to do it. I trust Him. And, and as long as I commit myself to Him, He's not going to let me down. No, He's not going to let me down. He's no respecter of persons. What He did for Peter, James, John, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, He will do for me and He will do for you. Extend your hands. Father, we thank You in the name of Yeshua. And we pray right now, we bless these seven teachings on heaven's destination. I speak the glory of the Lord will fall upon your people. I decree that your, their eyes will be open and their understanding will be open. I decree that those who are in the first heaven will arise and be promoted to the second. Those who are in the second will arise and be promoted to the third. In the name of Jesus and those who, who are maybe in between Hades and heaven, I decree that the power of your Holy Spirit will push them over to the side of heaven. I speak this blessing over every single person that is listening to me right now. And I declare the blessing of the Lord over their life. I decree that the devil will not steal one word from all these teachings. I decree it in Jesus name. I decree it in the name of Jesus. And I decree God's people to be faithful. I decree God's people to be faithful in all areas of their spiritual life. I decree this in Jesus name. And I leave you with this scripture, my wonderful friends. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May the peace of God that passes all understanding be with you. We love you in the love of the Lord. And we'll see you this Sunday physically here in church. Bye-bye.